tell you a little bit about this morning, uh, about the early church. And uh, uh, the book of Acts is uh, scripture, uh, the book of the Bible that describes the early Christian church. And, uh, and there was a church, and you know, it, it's amazing how we have uh, uh, current events that sometimes coincide with the message, and this is certainly one. We want to talk a little bit about an early church this morning in Antioch. Now, there were two Antiochs back in uh, biblical days, and uh, this one was located in Syria, and in Syria in the news even today. And so that's, I thought that was, that's rather interesting. But uh, this is a Syrian Antioch I want to talk to you about. And it was, it was a, a very, very uh, important church in the early history of Christianity. You see, the hello? <laughs> That's okay, folks. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. It happened. Could have been mine, but I forgot mine at home this morning. So. <laughs> she says good. Uh, but Syria and Antioch was very important in the early history of the church. You know, a lot of us did not realize that uh, in the early days of the church, primarily the church was among the Jewish people. There were not many non-Jews. Uh, Gentiles, as the Jewish nation called them. Uh, not many Gentiles were members uh, of the church. And quite possibly the reason is because in the early church, uh, the Jewish nation was the one that the people of the church were reaching out to. But it didn't take very long for the church to realize that the gospel in Christianity was was not just meant for the Jewish nation and the Jewish people. And what we see here in what we're reading this morning is the beginning of the, the swath of Christianity uh, being, being not just a primarily Jewish faith to Christianity spreading to, of course, the Gentile population of the world. And of course there were a lot more Gentiles than there were Jews. And there still are today. So we're going to begin reading in uh, chapter 11 of the book of Acts in verse 19. And here's what it says. Now those who have been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch spreading the word only among the Jews. You see, remember I said that it was, it was primarily spread, the gospel was primarily spread up at this point in time, primarily to the Jews. And so, uh, if you remember, Stephen was one of the early deacons or elders in the church. And you remember he was martyred, he was killed, he was stoned to death uh, by the same crowd that crucified Jesus. And so after his death, the church that was primarily in Jerusalem was scattered through uh, many parts of the, the known world at that time. And that's what this is describing. Now verse 20 says, Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also. <laughs> that's what... Uh, that was another name for Gentiles, was Greeks. You were either Jew or Greek, as far as the Jews were concerned. Telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. Now, the good news, that, that is what is meant by the gospel. That's what gospel, the word gospel translates to. So they were spreading the gospel among the Greeks or the Gentiles. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. The church at Antioch, the Christians at Antioch, began to be one of the largest groups of Christians in the world. Antioch was a large city, 
There were about 500,000 people, it's estimated, in the city of Antioch. Now, uh, you know, that that is a large city even today. But that was comparable to New York City or Los Angeles in uh, biblical times because there just weren't that, for one thing, there weren't that many people on the face of the earth at the time. And a, a city of 500,000 was a very, very large city. And the Bible tells us, or history tells us, the Bible doesn't tell us this, but history tells us that the church at Antioch grew to... Uh, the Christians that were numbered in Antioch were grew to about a hundred thousand people. That's about one in every five people that were inhabitants of the city came to be Christians. And then so whenever it says the Lord's hand was with them and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord, this was the, the beginning of that great sized congregation there in, in Antioch. <coughs> Now, verse 22 says, News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, I want you to note that the grace of God, remember I keep saying it's all about him and none about us. This was all God, and it wasn't any of these men. Just the same as it is today. When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. Now, I don't know if you remember or not, but Saul was one of the primary ones in the beginning of Christianity that was persecuting the church. But you remember, while he was on the way to Damascus, which is also in Syria, uh, whenever he was on his way to Damascus to arrest and imprison Christians, the Lord met him on the way, and Saul was converted to a Christian there on the road to Damascus. And he had been, he had gone back home after a period of time to Tarsus. And so Barnabas knew that he needed some help there in Antioch. So he went and he got Saul. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So a whole year, for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. And this is, this is the key, key verse here for the message today. It was in Antioch that the disciples of Jesus Christ were first called Christians. Have you ever heard what the word Christian means? The word Christian means Christ-like. So to be a Christian, we should be like Christ. And that's what I want to talk to you a little bit about this morning. So to be like Christ, and to be like Him, we first, don't we need to know what Christ was like? I mean, we, oh, you, 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 many times we think, well, yeah, I know what Christ was like. I don't know exactly what it's like, do we really? Have you ever really spent a little time thinking about what Christ is like and how we can be like Him? For as we are Christians, shouldn't we be what the description of the term that we go by is? Shouldn't we conduct ourselves to be Christ-like? Now, I have no problem that there are times that all of us who we claim to be Christians do not act Christ-like. There are times in my life, and I'm ashamed of this, whenever I have not acted very Christ-like. And that is something 
that we as humans and we as sinners, everlasting one of us for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, we are all guilty of that. So I'm not saying that we're going to be 100% successful 100% of the time being Christ-like. But I do believe this. The more we think about what Christ is like, the more we think about that, the more we study that, the more I believe we will be like Christ. We will come to emulate Him in our lives. And how important that is. You know, I, you know, I, I do not believe that the, the Greeks or the Gentiles there in Antioch would have been drawn to the gospel and drawn to Christ if those who came to preach the gospel to them, bring the message of salvation through Jesus Christ to them, if they had not conducted themselves in a Christ-like manner, that it would have been the powerful message that was heard. Because I believe that our witness verbally to people does not amount to much if they cannot see that our lives coincide with what we're saying. You know that practice what you preach say, don't say? You know, if someone is trying to convince you to join a club, let's say, anything, join anything, the Lions Club, let's say, and the Lions Club promotes certain things. You're not going to be very encouraged to join that person in the Lions Club if you see that guy that invites you to come and join is, is acting in a way that is contrary to what the Lions Club is all about. Now, is that not right? And if our lives do not back up what we're saying about Christ and becoming a Christian, they are not going to listen to us. So what was Christ like? What was his character like? What were some of the attributes of Christ? I want to share some of them. And I can only share some of them. Because at the end of the Gospel of John, John in writing, he said, I have not even begun to tell all the things that Jesus said and did. And he goes on to say, I suppose that if we could do that, the world would not hold all of the books about what Jesus said and did. So I just want to share with you this morning, in the time we have, a few of the things. And to encourage you, you know, we all need to get to know Jesus and what he's like better, do we not? I do. You know, I told you last week, I've been a Christian for 50, 53 years. Yeah, 53 years. And I'm nowhere near where I should be. First thing I want to share with you, that Christ was like Christ was humble, meek, and lowly. In Matthew chapter 11, Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus, if he were here today, and we're about to have a presidential election, I, I seriously doubt that Jesus would do very well running for president of the United States. And here's why I make that statement. In the book of of Isaiah, it says that 
the Christ, whenever he would come, would not have an appearance or a demeanor or a character that by itself would draw men to him. Now you think about that for a moment. And think about, you know, it, it's said that if Abraham Lincoln were running for president today, he would not even make uh, the first cut of the primaries. And they give us reason because the voters in, in Abraham Lincoln's day didn't even know what he looked like. And today they say with all the TV and everything, he was just too ugly to be elected president. Now think about that for a moment. Think about how shallow we are as a people that we will vote for somebody who looks good and talks good and has a charismatic persona. And we even follow preachers today that have that kind of charismatic persona. And the Bible says Jesus was not that kind of character. The thing I believe that drew people to Jesus was his meekness. Even if it was his message. You remember it says the people were in awe of Jesus because not because of how he looked, not because of his, his magnetic character. They said they were drawn to him because no man ever spoke. No man ever had the kind of message that he had, for he spoke as one with authority. And Jesus does have authority. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Second thing I want to share with you about Jesus' character is he was a servant. He was a servant. Matthew 20, verse 28, it says, Just as the Son, Jesus said this, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. He said, I have not come for you to minister to me, I have come that I might minister to you. I'm going to read to you an example from John chapter 13 about Jesus as a servant. Now let me, let me tell you before this, this was at the time of the Last Supper. And <laughs> just before Jesus did this, the disciples had been arguing among themselves about who was the greatest of them and about who would be the head honcho and chief head roller among the disciples. They were exhibiting a character defect that I think infects many of us. You know, how many of us want to be at the back of the line how many of us want to be the one that is not noticed, the one that is not praised, the one that is not the head person? Very few of us. And so it was quite normal and quite human-like for these disciples to start arguing with each other about who was the greatest. But listen to what Jesus did. He made an example. You know, he gave them something to think about. He just didn't say, y'all ought not act that way. How many of you kids listen to you when you say you ought not act that way, huh? Not very many. Jesus just didn't say it. He showed them something. And here's what he did. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Well, that's another character of Jesus. He loved without 
having to be loved back. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. You know, I've often thought about this. I often say it's a good thing I'm not God. It's a good thing I'm not Jesus. Because knowing that Jesus had all power, if I had been Jesus, I'd have been, as I say, zapping some folks. And you probably would too. But that wasn't Jesus. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Now, I want you to know something about this. This had really more meaning to those disciples than it does to us. I mean, we say, wow, Jesus the King of kings, Lord of lords, began to wash his disciples' feet. I mean, you know, that's something we wouldn't care to do today to each other. Isn't that right? But in Jesus' day, that was the lowest on the totem pole for a servant. I mean, you know, you've seen the movies. They wore sandals. And, you know, the streets were like some of our country roads. You know, they were not paved. And so you would walk and your feet would get dusty or muddy or depending on what the weather was. And whenever you entered into a house, a house that had servants, the lowest servant in the house, it was their job to wash the guest and the master's feet. That was the lowest of the low. If your job was the servant to wash people's feet, you were the bottom man on the totem pole. And so it got their attention when Jesus got up and began to wash their feet. It says in verse 6, He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. You're not ready for it right now. And there's some folks here right now that you're not ready for what we're going over. But I encourage you to think about it and you'll come around in time. Just like Jesus knew the disciples would. Verse 8, Peter said, No, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, Always the, you know, the overdoer. Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And Jesus answered, Those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you're, you are clean, though not every one of you. He was talking about Judas there. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Now listen to what he says. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Wow. The character of Jesus. He came as a servant. The King of kings and Lord of lords. He recognized who he was. He knew who he was. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. He was the one that should have had his feet washed if rights were to, to go here. But Jesus, after they had been arguing among them, 
himself about who was the greatest, Jesus said, that is not the example that I want you as Christians. That is not what I want to set apart Christianity, is to argue and fight over who is the head one in the church. I want you to be like me, servant, and to have a servant's heart. Think about this. Third thing I share with you is Jesus was not a worldly man. Listen to this, Matthew 8 and 19. Then a teacher of the law came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Think about that. Jesus did not even have a home. He had nothing. You know, these days, there's a, a kind of a teaching going around and has gone around of prosperity Christianity. Now, there's nothing wrong with being prosperous. There's nothing wrong with having money. There's nothing wrong with having stuff. But what is wrong is when we let it go to our head. And it becomes number one in our life. And it becomes the focus of our life. And I'm disturbed by the prosperity of Christianity because the teaching goes along this, that if you're really serving the Lord, if you're really close to the Lord, you're going to prosper financially. Jesus never said anything about prospering financially. He was talking about prospering spiritually. And that's what we should go for. And here again, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with having money. I'm not saying that at all. In fact, the Bible says what's wrong is the love of riches. That's the problem. And we have it very much in our society today. Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane for us in John chapter 17. It'd be good for you to go read the whole, the whole chapter of John 17 because it's Jesus' prayer for us. And here's part of it. Verse 14. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They, talking about Christians, are not of the world even as I am not of it. Romans 12 and 2, we talked about last week, you remember? Do not conform as Christians to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. To be like Jesus means not to be worldly minded. And finally, Jesus was a giving person not a taking person. Not once in the Gospels will you see Jesus taking advantage of his position or the movement that he started. He was always putting others before himself. For Jesus, it was always about ministering to others and not focusing on his needs or wants. So what does it mean to be a Christian? To be Christ-like. To be Christ-like, we should focus on being humble, meek, and lowly. We should focus on being a servant. We should focus on spiritual things and not worldly things. We should not be a worldly person. And we should be a person giving not take it. A lot to think about, is it not? I mean, at first reading, you say, oh yeah, I'm that. But are we really? 
I want to challenge you this next week. If you haven't already, and even if you have already, review is always good in the Scriptures. Search the Scriptures and see what Jesus was really like. And if we claim to be Christians, let us put forth that that attitude and that same character. You know, whenever we as a church reach out to our community, we will have much more power in our witness if we are Christ-like, if we practice what we preach. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I just thank you for the day you've given us. I thank you for your word. Heavenly Father, I just ask that you just impress it on our heart, our need to be like your son Jesus. There's so many more attributes to Jesus that time will not allow us to go over each one. In fact, there's not enough time in this world to go over all of Jesus' character attributes. But Heavenly Father, just help us to think about it, to dwell on it, to study it, and to see how we can be more like Him. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for being here. Come back.